our first question, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. I'm not sure if it's Karen or Corinne, uh, but you are up now. Our tech team has probably sent you a note to unmute yourself. Hi, Dr. Furman. I'm Karen calling from Mexico. Thank you very much for your great presentation. I love your cheebums, but onions, garlic, and bell peppers make me terribly farting. Does that mean I should avoid these foods? No, absolutely not. You know, I, I see people that can't handle salads and they can't handle beans and some people don't do well with onions and people sometimes can't handle certain things. So what we do is we never take it out of the diet completely. We lower it gradually, titrating down to the spot where it's not too uncomfortable for them so they can still tolerate it. And then over time, they're eating that smaller amount and they get used to it and they usually can start to tolerate some more over time. And, and having gas is not something that's abnormal or bad, but it usually reflects not chewing food well enough when you're eating it. You know, I know, you know people will ask me in my, to ask the doctor forum at, at my drfurman.com and they'll say, I'm seeing um, undigested food in my stool and there's something wrong with my digestion. I'm saying, no, that's not something wrong with your digestion. You, you don't have teeth in your digestive tract and you should be liquefying your food in your mouth so it's mixed with your saliva so well that it goes down as a liquid. So it's your job to liquefy your food with your teeth before you swallow it. And if you do that, you're better able to tolerate the things you think you can't tolerate as well, that you weren't chewing as well. But of course, if you don't handle beans, you use beans lesser and lesser amounts so they're not that uncomfortable for you, but you don't take them out completely. If you're not good with onions or garlic, do, do a smaller amount, but don't take it out completely. Get to a point of relative comfort and then stick with that. And usually you can titrate to an amount that's reasonable. And then with time, you'll see you can probably increase some. Thanks, Dr. Fermi. Up thank next, you for the question. We, yeah, thank you. We have Carolina up next. Yes, hi, Dr. Furman. Thank you so much for all of your work. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about multiple sclerosis and foods that might be good to for that condition and particularly uh, damage to the optic nerve. Are there any foods that or nutrition excellence that could help help regenerate or benefit that condition? I've taken care of hundreds of patients with multiple sclerosis, most of which have made people have made complete recoveries from relapsing and remitting and from early stage multiple sclerosis. There's some degree of progressive multiple sclerosis that gets to a point of damage that is, becomes irreversible. Um, but the idea that certain foods heal one part of the body or one disease and other foods hurt another disease or help another disease is not correct. It's the, an ideal immune supporting diet is best, basically best for all diseases. There's not one particular food that helps your nerves and another um, food helps your brain, helps your eyes, helps your heart, or helps your kidney. It's not the way the body works. Um, I'm saying that a Nutritarian diet emphasizes a full portfolio of healing foods. And I've had tremendous success, consistent success, people recovering completely from multiple sclerosis if we can catch it before major um, and irreparable damage has taken place. Now, there are certain foods that can hurt, that are bad for people with certain autoimmune conditions that people should not eat. Like we don't wanna give nutritional yeast for a person with inflammatory bowel disease, especially Crohn's disease. It can make good things worse. We don't wanna give alfalfa sprouts to a person with lupus. We don't wanna give, so there are certain foods that may be non-favorable for certain diseases, but there's not particular one food that's gonna be the cure for this particular disease. It's having this, having the diet that's well, that's best adapted with the most nutrient richness. We're trying to increase the nutrient quality of the diet. And with people with some of these autoimmune conditions, um, often juicing, adding one or two juices to their diet because they're invariably low in phytochemicals. It's why their immune system isn't functioning well. And by eating and chewing right is good, but it could take them too long to build up the nutrient density in their tissues for their immune system to normalize. So we accelerate the rate at which we get high tissue density of phytonutrients by using a juice of one third cruciferous, one third lettuce and celery, and one third carrot and beet. 
and they have that glass of juice in addition to their salads and their green smoothies and their other vegetables they're eating to increase the rate at which we build up their nutrient levels. Because your appetite and the amount of calories you consume is only so much, and we don't want people to force in too much food. So adding the juice enables them to comfortably get more vegetables into their diet. So the, this person with autoimmune disease, we're also get, making sure their omega-3 index is above five. And even people with certain types of heart disease, or genetic predispositions with certain alleles or lipoproteins, we have to make sure their omega-3 index is above five to adequately prevent brain shrinkage and be best for their health and their heart. And the same thing is true with autoimmune disease. So we modulate the supplement of the EPA and DHA and EPA, most often using a vegan supplement of EPA and DHA to make sure their omega-3 index is above five. The studies show that as you go to four and three to two, you get shrinkage of the brain with aging and cognitive impairment. And one of the most um, serious um, drawback of most people advising on plant-based and vegan diets is they're not careful enough with making sure people maintain an adequate omega-3 index with aging. That's one where blood tests is very valuable because we know with multiple studies that corroborate each other, number one, we know that lower levels of omega-3 increases risk of both cancer and cardiovascular death. But the main issue, of course, is shrinkage of the brain and cognitive impairment with aging with people with low levels of omega-3 index. And, we, and people absorb and convert omega-3 at different rates. So there's no one diet that's gonna give everybody a one amount that people could say, oh, I'm cutting doing this, I'm eating a lot of hemp seeds, I'm eating a lot of flax seeds, I'm eating a lot of walnuts, but that may work for you or may not. But in most cases, there's individual genetics that determine your need for whether you, how much supplement you need and whether you need supplementation or not. So it's very critical, especially with an autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis that you maintain an omega-3 index above five to maximize healing of nerves. Okay, thank you for the question. Let's go on to the next question. Thanks, Dr. Premin. Up next, we have N.W. If you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi. Hi, Dr. Furman. I take your probiotic blend, Flora Biotech, and I'm wondering when it's best to take it, in the morning on an empty stomach or at night, and also for the osteobiotech taken three times a day with meals. If I only eat two meals a day, should I take the third dose with a few walnuts for better absorption? Why do you just take two a day if you're taking, see, we're saying here that it's not good to take high dose calcium because high dose calcium can cal make calcifications in tissues and it's not good. So we want women who are postmenopausal, who have osteopenia or who need a little extra calcium because ca calcium absorption goes down with aging. We give them a little extra K2 and calcium and a small amount food-based calcium. And that's the osteobiotech this person's talking about. But we want you to consume it like food as part of the meal. So if you're eating two meals a day, just take two a day. If you're eating three meals a day, I don't think it's necessary to take a third meal or eat walnuts just to get the, you were trying to duplicate but the same effect if you had a higher cal, your meal had a little more calcium in it. So I would just take the two with you if you're only eating two meals a day and the days you eat three meals, take three. And then as far as the probiotic, the probiotic is I don't routinely recommend people need to take probiotics unless they've had antibiotics or have digestive disturbances, a history of reflux or irritable bowel syndrome or you know, chronic diarrhea. In other words, there's usually a reason for that. And then the, whether you take it with meals or how much you take is dependent on the reason you're taking it. So most people don't need to take a probiotic supplement, but those that do need one is better off taking the probiotic at the beginning point of each meal. Um, so I would take it, if you're in two meals a day, uh, two a day before the meal. But for example, I don't take a probiotic myself because I've been eating so healthfully for so many years and I haven't taken an antibiotic in probably 20 years. I think about 10 years ago, I got Lyme disease from a tick. I did, thought it was a, like a scab behind my knee and it was a tick and I developed a bullseye and I, took an, I had to take antibiotics for 10 days for that. And, but I took probiotics for six months after that, but I haven't really taken probiotics since. I don't need, think the need to because my diet is otherwise um, so um, perfected, you know what I mean? All right, thanks for the question. 